lot of the problems that we're facing in the world today you know i think of as kind of nature telling us uh, sorry <laughs> it doesn't work like that here you know uh, and, uh, and we need to rethink so you know we need to bring these different elements um the different crops the livestock the you know the trees the water and and human um living you know back into a um a, a more steady relationship and that has to be done locally you know it has to make sense locally in in terms of um you know the the, the local ecology in place <laughs> Chris Mage is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Chris co-runs a small farm in Somerset, Southwest England. Previously, he was a social scientist working at the University of Surrey and, and Godsmiths College. He has written about agriculture, ecological and social issues for a variety of academic and non-academic publications, and is the author of A Small Farm Future, which I have right here. It was published by Chelsea Green Press and uh, in 2020, so not that long ago. He blogs at www.smallfarmfuture.org.uk. He is currently a director of the Ecological Land Co-op. And in the show notes and description, we'll put all his links and links on how you can get his book um, in the show notes and descriptions. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. It's great to have you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. It's, it's very nice to be here. So we're obviously here to talk about your book, A Small Farm Future, Right. And uh, I, I've done this test to three people so far uh, and showed them your book. And I says, what do you think this book's about? And they're like, oh, small farming. So maybe regenerative, organic farming, permaculture. Um, I, I, I want to set it straight, right? Right in your subtitle of your book, you say making the... Uh, making the case for a society built around local economies, self-sufficient agricultural diversity, and a shared earth. And you do a fabulous job, but those who are <laughs> expecting to hear, hear um, uh, find a book just based off of the cover that we're going to hear a lot about farming practices and what to do best, they might be a little disappointed because you go deep and you go deep really fast. <laughs> uh, and, and I and I love it. And um, so I kind of just what if you don't mind in your own in your own words, I'd love for you to kind of set it up a little bit and what your thought process was behind it and why you decided to go in this direction for farming. And also, I would love for you to answer the question if um, how do you think that's received by those who would potentially be the new peasant farmers or the new small uh, agrarian farmers or the small farmers of the future, those who, who we'd hope to reach or kind of convert into creating these new economies and, and your thought process, are they, are they going to read this? Are, are they, are they well-read? Are we going to pick them up and catch them? Or do we need to kind of, through this podcast and other means, tickle them and grab them in another way? Right. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I suppose the genesis of the book, or, or like you say, you know, in some ways, maybe it's a bit misleading that uh, the small farm future title makes you think this is going to be all about farming, but there's a lot of um, politics and, 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 and history and, and kind of sociology in it. And I mean, I kind of think we face these really intractable problems in the world today, and, and you can approach them from more or less any angle, and they take you into, um, you know, a whole bunch of other things. I mean, I happen to start from farming. I, you know, I do think that's really important. I mean, I was an academic originally, as as you said in the intro, and and kind of. Uh, yeah, in, in, in the 1990s, when, um, you know, people were starting to talk about climate change more seriously and, and you know, environmental issues were rising up the agenda. And I guess I kind of was a little bit disillusioned with academic life and kind of had my midlife crisis a bit early. <laughs> so my wife and I, you know, we bought a little bit of land and, and, and started 
um, farming locally, you know, we felt that this was kind of an important aspect to, uh, yeah, you, you know, to, to get into and that to sort of get right. Um, but obviously it's quite hard as a, um, you know, any, any type of um, small business, small enterprise, you immediately kind of face the, you know, the big juggernaut of the global economy and the, the kind of way it, you, you sort of get a bit crushed under its wheels. And so that prompted me to start thinking and writing, kind of drawing on social science and kind of bigger historical stuff. You know, why is it, why is it so hard to, to farm right or to do anything, you know, right, to build, build locality, build community right? And um, the book kind of emerged from that. Um, so, and, and in terms of your question about, um, you know, will it appeal to, uh, you know, people, how, how will it, um, how does it relate to the new agrarianism? I mean, you know, at one level, I think, you know, some people find it um, perhaps a little bit over theoretical and, you know, a lot of people just want to get their hands dirty and, and you know, <laughs> grow some uh, grow some vegetables, you know, build a barn. And that's great because ultimately, um, you know, that that's a big part of what I'm arguing. You know, we've 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 sort of got to get down and dirty locally and, and, and kind of, you know, make our livelihoods and provide for our needs. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, one of the encouraging signs, I think, in recent years is that, you know, farming used to be kind of like, you know, who would want to do that? That's not a realistic job for anybody. But, you know, in the 20 odd years that I've been involved in it, more and more young, thoughtful, well-educated people are beginning to, to, to switch on to farming, um, you know, partly perhaps because the mainstream job market doesn't look quite as attractive as it used to be. But also, you know, for the same reasons I got into it um, people switching on to, um, you know, food, environment, climate, energy issues and thinking, yeah, you know, we really need to, um, you know, we, we, we need to get stuck into this locally. And, and hopefully my book will be of interest to, to those kind of people as a, you know, as a, as a kind of um, overview and guide through some of those issues. Absolutely. And I've, I've uh, seen you've done several podcasts around the world, you know, from America to to Europe and um, spoken with a lot of the thought leaders, all, also those who who get into the philosophy, the theory, the coming up with you know what what are different economies that can work for the future. So I absolutely love that. And th there is this thing. So I've I've been a farmer for six generations, uh, a biodynamic farmer. So Demeter. Um, right. uh, um, organic farmer uh, and in this in this thought process anyway that farming has become not only political it's become a science in, in a lot of respects of how you do it whether it's regenerative organics whether it's permaculture or even whether it's especially if it's industrial <laughs> agriculture uh very political and and um there's a lot of things you need to know and uh, right. not only in to how to, to how to run big big equipment if you do but also to to understand the mechanics and the politics and and uh, are are you going to are you going to be able to uh, sustain yourself sustain your family continue on multiple generations so uh, i love that you get into that and i think it's very fitting for many who are starting to say hey there's something wrong with our system there we've got to start to to do some fixing but right. before we go any further, I really, so we, we've actually had this podcast scheduled for, boy, I think over four or five months, where it was before we went into summer, um, I'd actually scheduled it with you and, uh, you were busy and, and, and working and couldn't, couldn't get with me, but, um, I want to know how in the hell have you weathered this crazy time? You know, we've had, the uh, the, the, you know, Brexit was part of it. We've had the pandemic. We've had coma, COVID. We've had Black Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter. So we've had these floods around the world that are really tied to climate change and bad farming practices and right. and supercell storms and things. Um, I generally am concerned. I want to know how you and, and uh, your wife and family have kind of weathered this storm. And has there been any learning lessons for you as a as a small hold farmer, as an uh, um, an agrarian, um, a new agrarian farmer, and I, I you know, I, we're we're gonna, we're going to get into some others. Any models that have come up and says, "Boy, we weathered this storm 
pretty good considering we had an economic downturn and all this other craziness going on in the world or right. were you hit just like everybody else or um, were there any kind of learning lessons that came up well i mean we've been very lucky really i mean you know here in southwest england uh, we haven't really been hit with some of the uh, you know the the freak weather events that we've been seeing um, in other parts of the world or even in other parts of england here you know london um, had some pretty big floods um but I think, you know, there are some agricultural learnings there in terms of diversity and, and you know, um, looking after the soil. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I emphasize in the book is trade offs. You know, it, it's um, it, it's it's really hard to optimize on everything you want to optimize simultaneously. You know, so you you kind of, you know, one way of dealing with floods and soil erosion is, you know, more perennials, more trees. Um, more cover crops and this kind of thing but then you, you you know you potentially lose a bit of yield um but then i think you know that's the direction we need to be going in you know not not trying to max out on yield all the time but maxing out on diversity biodiversity resilience to, to different events um but yeah we've been quite lucky here in, in that respect we haven't been hit too hard um this year Covid, of course, whole different thing. Uh, and again, our, our, you know, our business has been one of the ones that's been lucky. I know, you know, other businesses have been hit really hard, but um, partly with Covid and partly perhaps with Brexit, which is a <laughs> whole other story uh, running here in the UK at the minute. Um, you know, the supermarket shelves emptied um, in the early stages of lockdown and particularly they emptied of fresh fruit and vegetables, which is uh, you know that which is what we specialize in and is what supermarkets um you know are probably the worst at providing you know they're great at providing lots of processed um carbs and, and proteins but you know getting the, the the flow of fresh fruit and, and vegetable you know there are these you know huge quite um fragile global commodity chains um so yeah within uh within a couple of weeks of lockdown suddenly the supermarket shelves were empty and you know, normally we maybe get one or two um, new customer queries a week and suddenly we were getting like 200. Um, and that was a real lesson, I think, not so much for us, but for other people in, you know, in our locality about the uh, resilience or, or lack of resilience of supply chains. Um, and, you know, we did our best to grow a little bit more, bring a bit of land into cultivation. But, you know, we had to... Um, uh, we couldn't meet all of the demand. We had to put people on waiting list and try and prioritise, you know, people that we felt were, were you know, were, were, were most in need. Um, and, you know, that, um, I, I think that 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 did generate um, more interest and more thoughtfulness uh, about local food and supply chains. You know, inevitably, as the supermarkets um, readjusted, the shelves filled again and, you know, one or two people went back to their sort of old familiar ways. But, you know, I think... As you pointed out in your question, there are so many of these shocks coming from so many different angles that, um, you know, ultimately, I think we do need to rethink our models and and, and hopefully, um, you know, in our own small way, we're, we're trying to do that here. You, you've you been doing this for a while and, and you're a social scientist um, in academia for a while as well. And... I'm sure you just didn't write this all in just a couple of months that it was probably a, quite a journey. This is, I, I wouldn't say it's a biblical read, but it is a, it is a thicker, very well thought out read that uh, covers many different facets of complex system and also gets into some different um, philosophies, theories, some different points of views, and also touches on a lot of po political or things that could be very political. Um, I love how uh, the book starts out. So I, uh, I was one of the first 50 people trained by Al Gore as a, as a climate speaker and mentor and, and uh, right. leader um, in his ranch in Carthage, Tennessee. But through, through that uh, climate reality project, I had the opportunity to go to the Philippines a few times and do some training for other climate leaders. While I was there, I, I was given some civet coffee. Right. And this is the reason I bring this up. This is how and I, I don't want to give away your entire book, but I want to tease enough of, of some of the things that I just really found uh, uh, wonderful. And then hopefully people run out, grab the book and read it for themselves and kind of get into the deeper 
knowledge and the, the multifaceted perspectives of what we need to be thinking about for changing to different economic models, local economies, to different types of, uh, of farming and, and agrarian lifestyles or peasant futures, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, when I read that in the beginning, I was like, oh, and I and I was given this and it was presented, you know, this is coffee that comes from excretion of scat, basically poop uh, of these uh, these civet or i don't know it's a carnivorous uh, almost like a weasel fox or a little type of a i don't yeah, know I think, what you, what you'd yeah. even call them but, yeah they're, uh, i think they're they're their own kind of genus they're quite unusual creatures that you know yeah. we don't have them here in europe but yeah yeah it's, uh, it's kind of a weasel or a fox or kind of that's what uh, they look like but anyway they've got a real fine nose and so they find these coffee um that when it's just the right ripeness and they eat it and then as it goes through their system the bean just the bean of they eat the fruit and then the bean comes out and it gets this anal gland secretion on it. And um, the, in the story and the way you tell it, it's so interesting because us humans, we're so, uh, so uh, we try to see how, how, you know, how can we mass produce this? How, this is fabulous. This is a luxury coffee. It's great. How can we now cage these civets up and, and produce this on a mass scale instead of looking through the forest for poop, you know? Right. And, and I just want to read this last summation, if you don't mind, um, of, of what you say. Uh, it's, so, it's so spot on. In our bid to provide cheap food to our human multitudes, the trade-off is that a lot of people end up eating shit. Figuratively, and as we just seen sometimes literally you know so what they did is they rounded up a bunch of civets put them in cages and fed them these coffee beans that one weren't ripe weren't made by the smell of the civets um and then the product that came out was all, not only animal cruelty but it was a product that wasn't luxurious and that and, and it's so interesting because it, it is really that uh, that shit that we're sometimes eating. The way we produce is just crazy. How how we've gotten into mass production, industrial agriculture, using chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides, trying to get up to speed with population and things. And um, so that's how your book starts out, and it is unbelievable that uh that story is in there and i've tried civic coffee and and uh know the stories of those in the philippines who who are doing exactly that they're like oh this is that luxury coffee but what we've done is now they were the ones who were actually rounding them up in cages and trying to right. reproduce it and it and it's just not the same and yeah. then then um in your book you you really start out with what everybody kind of needs to know the the setting the bar at what's what's our world what's going on in our world in agriculture what are the problems the top crises we're finding and it's the 10 crises of basically population climate energy soil stuff water land health and nutrition political economy and culture and you go through those 10 crises and relate them to your small farm thinking and how, how can we deal that? What, what, what is the world that we're sitting on today? What are we dealing with? What, do, what does uh, uh, industrial agriculture, let alone a small farm have to deal with in this day and age? And really you um, not only enlighten us about those topics, which some people just don't know what farmers big or small have to deal with, and then secondly, what we need to do to get into another better situation, where's the future going on mm -hmm. that? And um, there's a lot of different views um, there. And uh, I really like how, how you bring that out and you're broken into, is it three or four sections, four parts, three parts? Yeah, there's four parts to the book overall. Yeah, yeah. And um 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm glad you like the, the civet story. Uh, you know, I, I learned about that and found it uh, kind of use it as a metaphor for the fact that, you know, we uh, it's kind of this real thing in, 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 in the modern world where we think, you know, uh, we find something that's that, that's good and we think, well, we could, you know, we can make that, um, you know, we can make more of that and we can make it cheaper. And, you know, there's this whole kind of narrative that there, you know, that there's we can do that with no downside. And that's kind of partly, I think, why we've got into some of the problems um, that, that yeah, you know, where we are. Um, and, you know, it's a kind of strange moment in global history where some people are, are like, yeah, you know, we need more of this. And, and you know, like you were saying, the way that we've industrialized food is, um, you know, as we were just talking about supermarkets, um, there are certain types of food, um, you know, that's something like 75% of global cropland is devoted to just 10 crops, which, uh, you know, mostly cereals and grain legumes, which are very easy to industrialize and 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 to process and to transport. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, they're great crops in, in, in many ways, and, you know, they've got a place in every agriculture, you know, we, we grow them because they they do a lot of good things, but we've kind of put too many of our eggs in one basket, um, basically. And, you know, there is a downside, um, you know, both in terms of the, the sort of global economics of that and how the food system entrenches um, poverty for farmers and for, uh, you know, people in communities worldwide um, and, you know, creates various other problems. Um, so, yeah, the, the book is, um, yeah, I kind of go through those crises and, and try and, um, um, sort of set up um, an alternative narrative and and part of that is to do with um, you know we tend to focus on um, the sort of initial problems that you mentioned like climate change energy um, water issues you know we often look at them as as kind of technical problems kind of engineering problems if you like and, and of course you know they do have that dimension but ultimately, they arise out of um, you know how we choose to organise ourselves as as societies. You know how we how we think about our relationships with each other and with the natural world. So I sort of try and have that trajectory from the more kind of immediate biophysical crises to you know issues like um, you know politics, economy, culture. You know ultimately that these are kind of spiritual issues almost. You know so. Um, so that's why the book, you know, it gets quite wide ranging because the moment you start talking about one of these things, you know, immediately, um, you know, it, you spin off into all these other other dimensions. Um, so uh, hopefully in ways that uh, are interesting to readers. I, I see it as really kind of the systems view of life and ecological perspective. You are the director or on the board of directors of the Ecological Land Co-op in, right. in the UK. And it's really interesting that you take this holistic, uh, systemic almost perspective that what, you know, all the things that you're touching about upon in these top 10 crises um, that, that we're facing, they're all really related to how our civilization functions, how the infrastructure is, and how they're tied to the basic needs of, of us homo sapiens. You know, do we need energy and we'd Food, we need water. We need these resilient infrastructures that are all bundled and tied together one way or the other, whether it's weather or climate, it's, it's tied to that bigger system of where we get our food, our water, how our infrastructure is set up. And, and um, do yeah. we do it because we're always running, running, um, kind of behind our exponentially growing world trying to keep up with population trying to keep up with production to to make sure we have enough or are we doing it because we're part of that system um not esoteric not religious or not kind of uh this uh this crazy type of view but how are we keeping up with our exponentially growing world? And what does that look like? What are the systems? And the main guise of the book is really local economies, small farms. Um, how do we create that resilience and that infrastructure there where we're at? Um, and, and in that guise, there's this, this thing that comes up, this political thing that comes up over and over. You touch upon it in many different ways how, you know, and, and you spoke about it when I asked you, you know, how have you weathered 
the storm um being a farmer a lot of a lot of uh, the global trade the global market your local economies affect do you make money do you have a market to sell at um how how does your your farm continue to go and, and how does the politics the local politics and inf influence that and so i really like that that's present in, in your book I, I need you to explain a couple couple more things to us so in the book you mention peasant futures a lot mm -hmm. and you mention new agrarian societies or to use the uh, uh term you know these small urban agr agrarian terms and things i'd like you to kind of explain or define them for us so that we understand what that looks like and um in some respects i almost want you at this stage to kind of tell us the the summation of some of the solutions it's in the cover of your book you know small farm future um but it's really about the, creating these local economies, these small right. farm futures. Yeah. Can yeah. you explain that to us a little bit more? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I mean, um, you know, reflecting back on what you were just saying, um, you know, one aspect of this, I think, is that most parts of the world over, over long history, over deep history, have figured out... Um, you know, some type of local agriculture or local livelihood making, which is um, quite renewable, quite sustainable, that cycles nutrients. Um, and it usually does it, you know, there's a kind of mixed farming tradition where we bring together the different elements of the landscape, um, you know, the trees, the, 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 um, the annual crops, uh, livestock, grassland, you know, ways of using water and so on. And it's usually quite um, labor intensive or as I've been taught, Helena Norberg Hodge taught me to say job rich. And you know, maybe that's a whole dimension of the conversation that we can have about, um, you know, different employment sectors and why, um, you know, why we need more people working in agriculture, whereas the whole narrative has usually been about getting people out of agriculture. But um, the, the kind of essence of that is kind of working with the landscape good landscape design integrating the different elements and it's almost like humans then are kind of skimming off just the surface flow of of, of the ecology and letting it do its thing but we've got into this whole other way of thinking in in um the modern period where it's very much you know you talked about exponential growth and that's very much um you know the model of the of of of, of the sort of global economy where we're always looking to maximize return on investment um and uh, you know i think that um you know has created some positive things perhaps but also has a downside you know we, we're back to trade-offs again and part of that is you know the downside is that the ecology doesn't really work in that way and you know we've tried to turn you know the civet coffee example is one you know it's like so often in agriculture it's like you know how do we you know how do we sort of squeeze more out of this how do we how do we make it cheaper and ultimately a lot of the problems that we're facing in the world today you know i think of as kind of nature telling us uh, sorry <laughs> it doesn't work like that here you know uh, and, uh, and we need to rethink so you know we need to bring these different elements um the different crops the livestock the you know the trees the water and and human um living you know, back into a, um, a, a more steady relationship. And that has to be done locally. You know, it has to make sense locally in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the local ecology in place. Of course, that's hard to do with climate change and, and, and you know, all the various other issues we're facing because it's not, you know, it's always a moving field. We always have to be, um, um, uh, you know, thinking ahead of the game. But, you know, that, that's the basic reality. I mean, the peasant thing is interesting. Uh, you know, in some ways, I regret um, Ray. You know, it's kind of a term that kind of raises so many issues and resonances. And um, you know, to some extent, I use it provocatively. Um, but you know, it's it's basically the idea of a self-reliant household. Uh, you know, set within a larger community, and you know, that's the way that a lot of agrarian societies have organised themselves historically. Um, and, you know, we tend to be um, quite scornful, you know, the word peasant in, in many uh, 
languages or many settings nowadays is kind of an insult, you know, but I kind of feel, you know, part of what this book is about, you know, we can, uh, it can be a bit misleading when you, you know, this is I, what I try and do in the book is not, uh, um, not look back romantically, not, not kind of create a rural little and say, oh, you know, everything was wonderful in the past. We just need to replicate that. But I think we do need to learn from the past, you know, people in the past figured out these systems because they had to solve real ecological problems and, and we can learn from, um, from what they did. You know, uh, one of the problems now is that we tend to be quite scornful about what people in the past did and, ah, oh, you know, we've moved on from that. But we haven't really, you know, we, we face um, the same kind of problems as to, you know, how to arrange our well-being, you know, how do we use energy, how do we interact with the ecology. So, you know, my book is, you know, kind of let's get beyond this kind of nostalgia versus progress thing and just, you know, just open mindedly learn from how people have done things in the past, um, not try and replicate it um, faithfully, but, but learn from the model. And that's where, um, you know, resilient household based farming societies where, you know, people um, know how to farm, know how to interact with their local ecology um, uh, and, you know, create um, uh, social institutions locally that support that, uh, you know, is, is, is something that we need to learn from. But, you know, it also has its downsides. And I, I, I try and sort of address that in the book, you know, in terms of various types of um, sort of inequality, um, you know, various issues we, 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 we have to solve. Um, but I think, you know, it's always worth wherever you are in the world, it's always worth, you know, looking at you know, what did the people going way back uh, before the modern period, um, before energy was so cheap, uh, you know, before the global economy made so many commodities available, you know, how did people organise themselves then to create a uh, abundance and, and livelihood? And we can always learn from that, even if what we actually do isn't, you know, isn't exactly the same as what they did. You know, I think that's the first place to look. Absolutely. And I love that you brought that up and I love that uh, it's it's in the book and you kind of in your own way and and in the book it's kind of a snapshot of big history and you kind of uh, let us know many many respects you you all you don't go too deep into it but you talk about civilization frameworks you talk about how these structures are you bring up a little bit about how religion played a factor in in some of these civilization frameworks and and how it was in the past and and uh, how, you know, the beginnings of agrarian society, you know, I it could be said that it's up to the 12,000 years old, one of the most successful economies our world's ever seen, the one that employs the most people and is still growing and thriving today, even in crises, because it's the basic of, of uh energy needs for humanity breathing food and water you know basically that's that's the beginning of energy and you 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 quote people like Vaclav Smil who's also said that you know he's written books on growth and also on energy and mm -hmm. more than half of the book is all about agriculture and these agrarian societies and how energy and these things start up and are, are still going to uh, till today yeah. It's it's really interesting because all those past models, those la lessons that we could learn of how it happened, how it occurred, how we got there, what it was like, why we did those things in the past, um, have have really shown us that it's a it's a linear and siloed model. It is local a local economy, but in a lot of respects, it's one that we've seen more than 20 civilization frameworks in, in, in the history of our earth that have collapsed. They're no longer here. We just see the ruins of them and all but two of those 20 plus civilization frameworks all collapsed because of environmental or ecological collapse. You know, there's old stories of Alexander the Great, you know, going through the Middle East and saying, giving his description and some of the earliest histories of, 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 of him describing what, what it looked like back then, green, lush, thriving, plenty of food and, and that, and now it's a desert, it's, it's done, it's, you know, there's not a lot going on there, um, right. as far as lush and green. Right. And that's, you know, that's a big problem, I think, in the modern world, you know, particularly with climate change. And, you know, one of the points I make in the book is that we, um, 
you know, one thing we've done is is become increasingly reliant on this small number of mostly cereal crops, which increasingly are grown in a kind of breadbasket parts of the world, you know, like the North American prairies would be one example, um, which are kind of semi-arid areas, which are, you know, very vulnerable to climate change and water stress. Um, and, um, but also productive, um, you know, as they've been very productive historically, but the, the kind of ironic result of that is, is by, um, uh, by producing this kind of real torrent of cheap grain, which partly emerges from all the sort of the, you know, cheap fossil energy and, and, and other inputs and, and also from government subsidies, um, you know, that has historically has tended to undermine um, people's um, ability to produce subsistence um, in other parts of the world and, and, and using kind of more local subsistence crops and that pushes people into a, you know, a, a sort of more of a commercial model of farming, you know, in, in, in lower income countries, you know, people producing, well, back to coffee would be one example, you know, or, or, or tropical uh, fruit crops. Um, and that can be a very precarious existence. So, um, yeah, you know, again, there's this sort of trade off this irony of, of sort of greater and greater productivity, threatening the, the, you know, the ability for us to, to, to keep producing, um, you know, to, to keep up that abundance, but also not being that great economically for us, you know, we need to, um, you know, we need to sort of develop locally our own economies. And that doesn't mean turning our back on people in other parts of the world, but, you know, but uh, kind of strength in diversity and, and, and sort of, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, attending more to those local ecological flows and making our local agricultures um, abundant and, and ecologically sound and resilient. And that means that kind of everyone, um, uh, you know, benefits from that. Do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders and divisions of humanity one from another? And I want and I want to kind of explain that a little bit in two respects. One, during this time of lockdown and pandemic, food was a global citizen. The pandemic was a global citizen, affected us all over the world. Uh, but humanity wasn't allowed to travel really we were on lockdown we had our borders closed a, a big distinction a rise of nationalism and um i, I want to kind of get your thoughts and feelings on on this on this view if you think that would solve a lot of our problems that kind of where we're kind of not globalization in that respect, but more so global citizens that we were also like species and food and things be, being able to move around the world and interconnect with each other. And the, the other reason I ask that is in your book, a lot of the, the, the science and theories and, and the people you quote, they're all over the world. They're, they're in the United States, they're in, in, in Asia, they're just stories right. and and historical things not only with religion their world-based knowledge that that we're getting with experiences around the world and you you mentioned uh helena norberg hodge and this is her book local is our future she does a lot with the ladaki it's basically right. uh, uh um you know like a little tibet uh, type of uh, a culture that he's seen these local futures occur, but she's from originally from Sweden and speaks German and linguists and been all over the world. So I, I want to kind of, for those who don't understand the distinction of this, how can we be talking about all these global histories, these learning lessons and, and these things, and what are the true feelings? But how do we convert that into these local economies right. and kind of be connected? And maybe you can help us as an educator in this wonderful book that you wrote, help us to understand how to decipher that. Right. Well, it's a great question. And I think, you know, in, in many ways, it's the, the, the kind of fundamental social question of our age. Um, I mean, the book... Um, was fairly, I, I, as you say, I did draw upon, you know, examples from many different parts of the world, but it was quite generic, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm here in the, in the UK and from a sort of rich country, global north perspective, so to some extent it's grounded in that, but 
you know, what I hope maybe is that people will sort of take the the the, the general analysis in the book and and sort of see to what extent it does or doesn't work or what modifications would be necessary uh, you know in their own setting but i think you know what we're going to see in the world with climate change and um uh, sort of energy the sort of energy squeeze in the future so so many of these kind of crises that we've been talking about um you know it is going to be a huge challenge to the existing system of nation states and we are going to see an awful lot of human population movement you know climate refugees and, and so on and um you know partly what i want to argue is that you know we've got to we've got to hang on to that sense of global citizenship at some level because if we um you know if we revert to uh, simplistic kind of nationalist narratives or kind of um you know here first uh, you know we're the you know we're the real people of this of this um neighborhood kind of ideas you know i think we're really sunk it's just going to be a recipe for so much um misery and violence uh, you know we're already seeing that in the world so uh, you know part of what i try and do in the book is uh, almost kind of like make a virtue out of the necessity and say look you know there's going to be people from all over the place all all different backgrounds um you know there's there's going to be um the world is going to be upended in so many ways that we need to kind of create um farm societies from a new um and and partly because you know uh, in many parts of the world certainly here in the uk not many people know about or involved are involved in farming and you know that's a problem but perhaps it's also helpful in the sense that you know we have to you know we have to learn this together we have to sort of create almost artificial institutions and i sort of talk a little bit in the book about the traditions of civic republicanism and and and, and such like as ways of, of 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 helping us do that um but it is, uh, you know, uh, and uh, as I was saying earlier, I think as much as is possible, we need to stay communicating with other people. But, you know, one of the ironies is that by attending to um, local needs locally, um, rather than assuming that we have all the answers for people in another part of the world or that, you know, it's good for us to send our exports off um, to other parts of the world, I think actually having a little bit more local distinctiveness is actually a positive in terms of creating, um, you know, positive connections between people in the world. But it's definitely, um, uh, you know, that that I think is the real fundamental social question, uh, you know, as to, you know, how do we manage this transition in, um, you know, the sort of the very fundamentals of our sort of economic and social thinking, which has been about nation states which has been about um global trade and you know the, my argument is kind of almost ironically that the you know the true globalism sort of is in localism um but in being a, a kind of you know you hear the term cosmopolitan localism sometimes which i quite like you know it's it's not a localism that's kind of jealously guards its boundaries and tries to keep people out it's a localism that embraces, you know, whoever is in place and tries to figure out, um, you know, viable um, ecological, but also social systems. Um, but, you know, that has to be worked out. You know, you can't just write a book about that and kind of say, you know, here, this is how you do it. It kind of has to be done in practice in place. So, you know, all, all that you can do as a writer or educator is kind of draw attention to the issue and, and draw on some resources that might help. and. You know the real um the real challenge is is you know is actually sort of realizing that um you know on the ground politically in in real life so in the book you also touch upon a couple couple things that uh um and, and a couple different sections of the book where you touch upon neoliberalism and darwinism or neo-darwinism as well and I speak about that a lot, and the, uh, the reason is, is really as a farmer, and I think especially as an organic or small whole farmer or su subsistence farmer or, or one who is doing permaculture practices, different types of that, there's this much deeper connection with the ecology of the land. There's a much deeper connection with your nature and surrounding and and how you use those as uh, or or you integrate as harm, harmoniously as possible to kind of support each other uh, 
and this this um, sustaining sustainable system or this ecological system that goes on forever. And in neoliberalism and neo Darwinism, there's really this this thing that comes out quite a bit: natural selection, survival of the fittest. Only the strong survive. Severe competition, which is going back to industrial agriculture, global commodity trade of food and products being shipped thousands of kilometers around the world. Um, you know that that there's some insanity in our industry um, uh, in agriculture where people are shipping potatoes or crops thousands of kilometers across the world, and those same crops are coming back into the same location to be consumed at those grocery stores. But those two worlds aren't speaking to each other, but that insanity of trade or that market that uh, food as a commodity is just um, not only co severe competition, this neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, but it's also um, just not how our world works. And I'm kind of more of a proponent of Lynn Margulis, and I don't know uh, right. how much you know about her, but um, basically that it's the symbiotic earth that's only in collaboration and cooperation that we work in harmony with, with all other organisms, bacteria, microorganisms, and this permanent culture um, and way of yeah. doing farming and interacting that, that is one that can be resilient and sustain over long periods of times. And so I love that you touch upon that and you bring that out. And um, whether we're industrial farmers or small farmers or organic farmers, I think we're not against each other. We, there is a way to combine and kind of enlighten our, each other, how, how we can transition to something that will give us resilience and show us how the world really works. And so, I, I guess that that for me it ties to this this global perspective because it's not nationalism, survival of the fittest, natural selection, which is a very a nationalistic way of looking at the world or a very divided way of looking at the world, but it's more the symbiotic Earth or symbiotic planet, which is uh, it's local to the indigenous microorganisms and to this this symbiotic view locally. But it's so much bigger than that. It's that we're all these crew members on this spaceship Earth. And so I'd love to get your perspectives and why you uh, kind of touched upon those in, in a little bit uh, in the book. But does that also why you why you touched upon um, kind of close towards the end, you kind of touched upon how do you go towards this small farm future? And it's the super uh, sedure state of uh of, uh, of farming, maybe explain to us a little bit more about that or make the connection unless I'm totally off base. Um, yeah, well, well, you know, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. It kind of raises so, so many different issues um, there. But yeah, I mean, you know, one of the problems is that the availability of cheap energy, you know, has, has led to this sort of situation of Kind of breaking down the coherence of the local ecology and like you say then you've got you know the the we're, we're sort of maximizing on you know the, the 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 kind of um the value that can be extracted globally from you know whatever the kind of easiest flow of commodity crops is so we get back to that thing you know like the 10 crops the cereals or you know what um whatever it might be um but you know, I mean, that's the the the, the funny thing about um, you know a, a, an evolutionary perspective is that it it's um, or or a social Darwinian perspective. I mean, I often think of a of an animal like the dodo, you know, which became flightless on its island because there was um, there was no virtue to being able to fly when you're um, you know a large bird on a on a sort of ground dwelling bird on a small island. So that was a kind of a strategy of evolutionary fitness but then of course people come along and a flightless bird is um you know almost literally a sitting duck and it becomes extinct um uh and that's the you know there's a kind of blindness to that process of uh you know natural selection doesn't think ahead but people you know we are able to think ahead and we are able to um you know not just to sort of identify you know what's going to make me the most money right now um you know it's more about um 
uh, you know, how can I make um, this system that I'm part of resilient to long term threats? And, you know, ultimately, what is what is life about? Natural selection never asks, well, you know, what is the purpose of life? Um, but, you know, cultures do, people do. It's, you know, how do I create good relationships with, you know, my my family, my neighbours, my friends, my community and, and people in the wider world? So I think, you know, those are the questions that we just really urgently need to be asking right now and not assuming that, um, you know, ways of maximising value or profit are, are going to sort of deliver that by by default. Um, you know, that's kind of the Adam Smith argument. I mean, actually, I talk a little bit about Adam Smith in the book, who was actually a more sophisticated thinker than, um, you know, than is uh, than you get from that kind of uh, invisible hand of the market um, sort of thing. But but but, you know, that's certainly been one development of his thought that, um, you know, if we kind of selfishly concentrate on our own um, immediate needs, then somehow that's going to generate um, wider collective benefit. And I think, you know, we it's pretty much clear that that isn't the case, <laughs> certainly not in, uh, you know, over the long run. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'd, 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 um, I'm, I'm on board with you there that, um, you know, we need to develop um, more resilient local farm systems that, um, you know, that w where we're uh, alive to the uh, to the different challenges on them and where we put them into this social context of you know what is this all about ultimately you know what are we trying to achieve and you know that's one of the funny things here our little site here we've got lots of people coming through we've got educational projects um you know kids who are on the point of being excluded from school we have a little project where they come here and um you know just just get to experience nature and it you know it can be quite transformative for them and uh, you know we we need to sort of widen those those connections and those thought processes. Um, in terms of your question about the supersedure state, I guess that was um, um, again another metaphor from nature, from 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 beekeeping. It, it's partly um, and and it it does touch on those issues you were talking about about sort of nationalism and migration and future politics. Um, I mean, my feeling is that um, we have these sort of centers of economic and geostrategic power globally. Um, uh, you know, the US is an obvious one, but you know, other, other parts of the world too. And, um, and even and within a country, you know, it's the same thing. It's a kind of fractal thing where, you know, here in the UK, it's kind of London and the Southeast that kind of dominates um, the scene economically. And I think you know that 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 isn't going to change overnight, but increasingly those power centers are you know it comes back to this extractive neoliberal model. They are drawing more and more value um, out from more distributed systems and sort of giving less and less back. You know, one sort of going back over the last couple of hundred years, part of their success has been you know developing welfare systems, developing healthcare, social systems and so on, but increasingly those are in crisis and it's kind of like people are, uh, are, are kind of putting more and more in and getting less and less out. And when you add to that, um, you know, the various crises we've been talking about, um, you know, climate change, energy, water, the, 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 the kind of global migrations that we're going to see, I think we're going to get to a situation where the um, the economic and political power of those centres wanes without necessarily disappearing entirely. I mean, you know, there's not going to be some revolution that's going to kind of um, destroy London. You know, there aren't some sort of goths waiting to sack London in the way that they, they, they once did Rome. Not right now, anyway. But nevertheless, I think people are going to have to figure out these systems um, a little bit more autonomously locally, you know, that that um, and that's going to create frictions, you know, and, and it's and it's very hard to, you know, again, as I was saying, the, the, the book is quite a general political argument. And I certainly can't predict, you know, exactly how the politics are going to play out here or anywhere else. I mean, you know, in some ways, it, it's kind of crazy trying to write a book about the future because, you you know, you're bound to be wrong in, <laughs> in some sort of fundamental ways. It's, you know, it's, it's a, a it's a, ideally I wouldn't really want to sort of be writing about the future, but I kind of feel like you know the generations on earth at the moment we have to because it's so clear that the way we've been doing things you know in 
um, up till now, over the last couple of hundred years, um, you know, are, are going to change. They're going to have to change. So we, you know, we need to apply our minds to that. But, you know, I, so I try and avoid too much sort of um, detailed prediction or too many sort of blueprints about, you know, this is my ideal society that everyone should follow. It's more about, you know, what are the kind of contours, you know, what are the kind of political and economic drivers and, and forces that are going to affect us and how can we try and, um, uh, you know, we, we're not going to be able to fight against them. Kind of like being a farmer, you know, you, uh, you can't um, you can't stop it raining. You you can't stop the, the sun shining, uh, you know, all sorts of things you can't control, but you try and work, you know, within them to sort of get out of it, um, you know, what, what you want. And I think we, you know, we need to have the same mentality with our political and economic systems. So it's kind of like, how do we, you know, how do we create localism in the face of centralized states or, you know, sort of ideas of nationalism and the nation state that are not going to disappear. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to disappear overnight, but I think they're going to weaken and, you know, potentially they could, um, uh, you know, they could retrench themselves in, in all sorts of problematic ways that, you know, we are seeing in, 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 the, in the world at present. So I guess my book is about, you know, how can we, you know, how can we put a different twist on that narrative? You know, how can we try and create a better future out of them? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm on board with you in terms of, I think, the poverty of some of those um, kind of neoliberal and social darwinian frameworks you know we need some other stories for sure yeah and i think you do a fabulous job of that i i'm in total alignment with you that we need to ask ourselves those questions we need to understand the big history and we kind of need to hear about those stories if we do, if we weren't educated in school about them but we need to start thinking and asking ourselves there because the and I don't even think it's you're putting yourself out there on a limb by saying, well, it's kind of hard to predict the future or write a book about the future because we need that. If, if you don't, and that, this is going to be my hardest question I have for you today, uh, I'm going to ask it in, in just a minute, because if we don't have a clear vision or even a, a, a kind of a blurry vision of what the future is or where we're going, I guarantee you we're never going to get there. Right. <laughs> Without some kind of a course, a direction, a roadmap, or an idea, then whoever is in power, whoever is politically leading for that four or five or eight year period or, or whatever it is, are are the ones who are going to be setting that for you. And, you, and I guess that's where we become sheeple. We just kind yeah. of a, just kind of going wherever the wind blows or wherever whoever we're following. But if we ask ourselves those questions, I think that's uh, that's that's really important. Um, before I ask you the hardest question today, I want to kind of there was one last thing that that I really love that you touch upon in the book, and so it, it it kind of has to do with this ecological footprint. This uh, uh, Earth Overshoot Day was July 29th this year. Um, the day we went beyond the finite resources of our planet in Germany, the Germany's overshoot day was Cinco de Mayo. So May 5th, four right. months into the year and five days, they were already over their resources. But that's based on this 1.6 global hectares, which is replicable, which means that if we each had that individually, um, we could live a ripe old age. If we were good stewards over that 1.6 global hectares, to have enough food, water, security, shelter to self-sustain ourselves on a small farm. And right. in, in the book, a couple of times you say, boy, if we had that 1.6 global hectares, uh, uh, what would our world look like? What would it be? Um, I guess my question back to you is twofold. One, why, why did you mention that? Why did you bring it up? And two, um, it, it, it's it's really uh, it is possible for each of us to have that 1.6 global hectares, but it's a political thing in, in many respects. I want you to know to, for over I think it's over 35 years we've been using the global hectare calculation. It's scientific. It's mathematical. We've been using that for over th 35 years to calculate Earth overshoot day, but we could use it 
as an economic model, as a small hold farmer, as a local economies basis to, it's a twist on universal basic income. It's a twist on empowerment, giving back to each individual to have them be the stewards. And, and yeah, they can still be part of communities and bigger cities. Uh, you, you give that stewardship or that global hectare to your community or city. And if they're not good stewards of it, you say, I'm getting the hell out of Hamburg. I'm going to go give it my global hectare to another city who treats the resources and the infrastructure the way that's going to sustain us well into the future. And so I kind of, you know, that twofold question, why did you include it? Why did you talk about it? Or maybe we could have a discussion about that. And how do you feel about us using that as an economic model, we've been using it in the negative way to calculate how shitty we're doing, I guess, uh, earth overshoot. But why couldn't we give that stewardship and use that as an economic model that, that we already believe in? We don't have to debate it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using it for 35 years. That's maybe part of the solution to give that New, uh, new agrarian, new uh, peasant futures, uh, you know, small yeah. farmer. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, you know, maybe one way to, um, to, to, to get into answering that is just to go back to your previous point about, or my previous point about thinking about the future and utopianism, you know, because again, we use this term utopia very pejoratively. It's like, oh, you know, you're being utopian. But I think we do. I, I agree with what you were saying a minute ago. We we do need utopias. We do need to sort of fix our our, our sight ahead and, and and think, you know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Um, and, you know, the problem is if they're, uh, you know, it can be sort of too unrealistic. Um, you know, we, it, um, we need to be aware of the sort of complexities along the way. But, you know, to my mind, nothing is more utopian and unrealistic than the existing neoliberal model, you know, that kind of um, caricature of Adam Smith, that if we all just selfishly make as much money as we possibly can, everyone will be happy, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's real problematic utopianism. Uh, so I think we're sort of caught in this weird moment between utopia and dystopia. I think the, you know, the, the kind of 1.6 hectare thing um, you know, you could say, well, that's an incredibly utopian vision that, you know, everybody has their bit of land to, um, you know, to, to, to produce their food and fibre. And, uh, you know, obviously in real life, it's, it's more complex than that. We don't necessarily want everybody to be farming. You know, landscapes are different. You know, there's, there's different types of farming, different sorts of needs. But I think it's, um, it's useful to... Um, to have it in mind as uh, as and, and and to ask well you know why not why not more self reliance why not more you know back to the land more more homesteading um, you know certainly we couldn't lead the sort of lives that a lot of people um, you know are familiar with in 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 sort of very urbanized industrialized global north countries in terms of the level of consumerism but then you know that again trade offs that has its downside and I was just talking about the kids you know coming to our place who are so alienated you know so much loneliness so much um you know so many sort of urban problems violence drugs you know um so um yeah so i think you know it is worth um focusing on um on a different kind of future and on uh, you know again going back to those ecological cycles you know if you've got um access to a spread of land you know you potentially have your food you have your fiber um you know you have uh, ability to build a, you know, to create a dwelling, you have potentially a community and, you know, none of those things are, um, are you know, are completely straightforward, um, but it's something um, to, um, to, to, you know, to, um, to sort of aim at. And, and part of the issue there is I think, um, you know, not, um, you know, not pushing in that exponential growth direction. It's kind of self-limiting, you know, if you produce your food, if you're part of a community, you don't necessarily need that much more and I you know I talk quite a bit in the book in parts about this kind of tension between asceticism and um and, and and consumerism you know because more and more stuff doesn't necessarily make us happy you know um so again there's 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 you know that there, there are these trade-offs um you know it can be dystopian if you're if you're scratching away on a tiny plot of land you know there's there's no kind of um accumulation of resources there's no kind of supportive community you know that's a kind of 
worst case scenario. So it's um, you know it's 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 a matter of of trying to make the you know trying to make the best of 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 that likely future anyway, because we know for sure that um, you know heavily urbanized industrialized societies that we've created are so energy and water um, reliant that you know it seems to me that that you know they're not really sustainable in the long run. And in terms of you know turning it around and 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 um, and, and, and sort of making an economic um, uh, narrative around it, yeah, uh, it's an interesting one. I haven't sort of thought the implications of that through fully, but I think um, you know certainly a lot of this ultimately is about um, uh, inequalities of economic power. You know how we how we create boundaries um, uh, between ourselves. You know, a, a lot of this is about kind of property rights. And I talk about that quite a bit in the book. You know, I think we get a bit too hung up on these different political philosophies that, you know, it, it should be, you know, land should be run by the government or it should all be commons or it should all be privately owned. And, you know, all, all of these things have their pros and cons and they all ultimately um, devolve to questions about, you know, who is making the decisions, you know, who has the power here, who's being included, who's being excluded. And it, you know, whether it's public, private or commons, those questions are, are, are always there. So, um, yeah, again, as I say, I, I sort of chart out a fairly generic picture in the book and, and you know, exactly how you uh, organise your commons, organise your farming, organise your property boundaries. Um, you know, that's going to have to be thrashed out locally in terms of you know, uh, partly in terms of local traditions and histories, but also those have to change in the light of, of new realities. And that's where the, you know, that projecting forward, that that kind of new utopianism comes in. Um, so, you know, I, I can't chart it out, um, you know, for, for every place in, in, in great detail, but those are exactly the questions that we really need to be focusing on right now before they, you know, the more that we can, think them through in advance, the more utopian we can be in a way, um, you know, the less they're going to catch us out when, um, you know, when it comes to the crunch. It's always uh, uh, interesting because in, uh, in some respects, so we, we call it utopian if we don't have a lot of case and examples where we can say, you know, no, there, there are examples or studies that have been done that these are better models to, to go into those more sustainable or ecological type of futures that are more local. And, right. and really there's more and more cases every single day coming up that uh, conventional industrial agriculture is so inefficient that even some very uh, hectare per hectare hectare equivalents, uh, small hold farmer, permaculture, regenerative ag, a mixed use uh, biodiverse, uh, equivalent piece of uh, of land to industrial ag is much more fertile, better for the soils, better for the environment, and much more diversity in the type of crops and the year-round harvest of, of of different type of crops that they're seeing the not not only the short term but the long term returns just a, a numerous. Uh, come out there and there's uh, just this year alone, there's already been well over 16 new studies that have come out just say it's, it's hands down, it's a better model. Um, uh, right. One of one of my friends and authors in, in my book, uh, um, Menu B is Mark Shepard. Mark Shepard does regenerate uh, regenerative agriculture, re restorative agriculture is his book. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, living proof, you know, water for any farm is this other book and, uh, restoration agriculture is this, and he just talks, you know, that's, uh, let, let nature kind of do its thing and, uh, set up your, your farm, no matter how small, um, into, into something that kind of you let nature work with along with you and you're not fighting it with chemicals and pesticides and, and things yeah. and that the over over time the returns are just continually coming back even up to large-scale farmers i have 
um, Eric Tonsmeyer, he wrote the, the carbon farming solution book, you know, and he, he was part of the drawdown review from Paul Hawkins book. Right. Same thing. He, he has a much smaller, I don't even think he's on um, an acre of land. It's just a plot right in the middle of the city in Boston, um, right. Massachusetts that he's, you know, he's got an abundance of, of fruits and trees and vegetables and, yeah, uh, him and his son and uh, are doing fabulous yeah. on that. That there's cases that if we can do it differently, we can do it. Yeah. You know, what I think this industrial ag that we're getting in that that we you talk about in in the book a little bit on you know especially with the story in the beginning of how we're trying to keep up with the population demands and this high processing and how can we get the biggest return and efficiency is sometimes really coming back to bite us in, in the butt. And it's really um, a, a, a crappier product, a shittier <laughs> product. And, and it's bad for health and our environment and, yeah. and human health. The, yeah, the question... Sorry, I mean, sorry no. Yeah. No, you're fine. The, the, um, the, the, the heart, I want to ask you the burning question, the hardest question I have for you today. And it's really... Um, the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, which everybody probably these last two years have been saying, but it's what's what's the futures, and I say plural, you know, what's your vision, what's your plan, we know, we know it's a local economy, small futures, small farm futures, but I just, in your perspective, kind of maybe even as a summation as well, what's the plan, what's the future, um, what's, what's your vision? Well, I think it's, um, I suppose my vision is a sort of mixture of utopia and dystopia, <laughs> where I kind of, you know, as I was saying, I think, um, you know, so much of what um, we have become used to, I mean, it kind of touches on the points you were just making about the way we've become accustomed to the, the concept of livelihood is about an income, it's about money. Um, and, and if you're a farmer, it's about making, uh, you know, maximizing your income from a product. But and that's partly to do, you know, certainly in the rich countries with the fact that um, energy is cheap and labor is dear. So, you know, we we um, we, um, we we sort of move to that quite monocultural model, whereas, you know, a livelihood well-being is actually producing a diversity of foods um, that we like to eat, uh, producing the fibers that we need, um, you know, for construction uh, and other such things. So, you know, my model um basically is a job rich uh, peopled countryside um you know certainly um small towns um market towns um you know not so much the sort of big mega cities which i think are just you know they're, they're only sustainable with um cheap fossil energy um um you know people living and working in the countryside people um in you know involved in trades allied with that um and I think that's going to come about um, partly through force of circumstance, which isn't going to always be very pleasant. You know, um, it's easy to mock this sort of thing as this kind of bucolic um, vision of the past. Um, but it's possible for it. You know, it, it's a vision that a lot of people want to do. You know, a lot of people, you know, they work in the city, uh, they retire. What do they do? They want to buy a, a small holding in the countryside or, you know, they want to they want to have a garden, you know, so it's. Um, you know, in some sense, it's about kind of embracing that thing that, you know, um, and kind of not being embarrassed about um, um, advocating for, um, you know, the, the, the romance of, of, of you know, um, biodiversity, the garden, the farm, but also being realistic that, you know, it, it's hard work. Um, there's a whole bunch of problems that have to be solved, you know, the, the you know, farm communities are not always, um, um, you know, harmonious. There's all sorts of issues about sort of gender and inequality. Um, so, you know, my vision is is really, um, because we have to, grounding that kind of small scale, um, rural, productive, um, you know, moving to uh, a model of producerism rather than consumerism, a world of, you know, growers and eaters, as it's sometimes called, rather than producers and consumers. Um, and, you know, being positive about the, the good aspects of that whilst, you know, whilst not trying to sweep under carpet the fact that, um, you know, it's hard work. Um, 
it's hard work physically it's hard work getting the politics right but you know that is the world whether we like it or not that i think we're moving towards um and so that's what we've got to focus our attention on i love that i have uh, three more questions for you and they're for my listeners they're really uh takeaways for them that the kind of they can maybe apply in their life uh, if if there was one or two messages you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that really has the power to change your life or a way they should be looking at the world, what would it be your message? I suppose it would be get growing, <laughs> get gardening. And you can do that, you know, even if you live in a, you know, in a city tower block um, you can grow some stuff on your windowsill, um, you know, uh, but you can also organize and get talking to people locally. And that's the key thing. I think, um, you know, if you start asking, well, where does my food come from? You know, how can I, how can I support a, um, you know, a positive and life affirming food system um, rather than a, a negative and life destroying one? Um, you know, not everyone is in a position to sort of, you know, we can't all just move to the country and, live this kind of homesteading life but by asking those questions about food and by trying to take charge of it in our lives in you know in however humble a way that we can it starts to build a kind of a, a new narrative and a new politics around it and and you know that's what we need so at whatever level get growing i guess would be the message <laughs> that's beautiful i'm um, you you mentioned that uh, you have kids coming uh, out to your farm and kind of an experience thing what what uh, should young innovators young people coming out to your farm um who are going to be in your field or not be thinking about when they're looking for ways to make a real impact on this world or to change their lives? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, you know, we need to be talking about access to land for sure. You know, one, one of the problems with, uh, you know, with the way that um, land works and I talk a little bit about it in the book is, the way that um, property tends to concentrate, um, you know, it's like we play a game of monopoly and somebody always ends up with, um, you know, <laughs> with all of the properties. And that is something that, um, you know, that, that needs to be addressed. So young people, they need to be able to get on the land and have access to land. I mean, there's any number of, you know, we can talk about all different farming systems and, um, you know, whatever, but people need to, um, you know, they need to have an opportunity to try things and to experiment um, and, and, and hopefully to do it, you know, use the accumulated uh, wisdom and capital that we have in our societies to make that, um, um, you know, not, not too um, traumatic a process. So, you know, you mentioned the, the ecological land co-op that I'm part of, that's something that you know, within the limitations of the system we're in that the, that the ELC tries to do. So, you know, I think young people need to keep some pressure on like, hey, you know, farming, you know, I need to get into farming, you know, what can my, my elders and betters, you know, how can they help me do that? How can they help me realize that vision? I love that. And really the last question is, more so for you because you were a social scientist and academics you still are but uh, you were very heavy into it before in your life what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey to today that you would have loved to know from the beginning from the start say oh, if i had known that it would be leaps and bounds ahead a, a lot of people say it was the journey a lot of people say yeah. that nothing it's the journey uh, but well, it, yeah, it has been the journey. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think if I'd known too much about what would lie ahead, I might not have <laughs> undertaken the journey in the in the first place. But it's been a, um, yeah, sort of learning, um, you know, coming to farming late, you know, I think, it, 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 you know, to be a good farmer, you know, people are often quite scornful about uh, farmers or people that work with their hands and to be a truly skilled farmer is is just a lifelong um process of learning and observation and i you know i feel like i'm you know a friend of mine calls himself a trainee peasant and i think that's kind of about right you know i i feel like a you know like a a, a real novice um 
But I think, you know, that one of the learnings, I think, is that we live in this very um, kind of word dominated and, and sort of intellect dominated culture. And it's very easy to write a story about how the world is um, that um, kind of ignores the feedback that the physical world gives us. So, you know, one of the things that I've learned from about farming is that, you know, you know, hell, this this machine doesn't work or, you know, the weather has destroyed this crop you know and you know if you're sitting in a study if you're an academic you can sort of write a story that works its way around you know these the kind of um feedback of the messy feedback of life but you can't do that on the farm and you know i think certainly social scientists or uh, you know um it, it's kind of easy to um you know it's easy to, to to sort of build a story that um yeah you know that is a little bit detached from from ecological and physical reality so you know there's always something to be said for goes back to get growing you know just um grow some crops get an allotment you know have, have a garden and i think it, uh that is a real stimulus to thought of, of you know whatever else you might be doing or whatever else you prioritize in your life you know there's always a case for uh growing some growing some crops <laughs> That's absolutely true. And it's even possible for those people who are, are my listeners who live in an apartment or in, right. in a small place. I know a lot of people doing sprouting in, in apartments and having windowsill, smaller gardens. And, and it's amazing what's, what's coming out of some of those. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good learning lessons, depending where they are, they're at around the world as well, uh, of different type of bugs and and things right. that just occur naturally from overwatering or whatever their situation is, but that it's pretty much doable anywhere, even in an urban setting. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, um, Ron Finley, is the gangster gardener. He's doing it in Los Angeles, right? You know, in, in, right. in the middle of a city. So it, it is uh, it is really possible to do anywhere and get started. But the, the hope is to get out into some real land and into nature and, and do it uh, uh, wherever possible uh, in true nature. Chris, this is all the questions I have for you. Uh, and this is your opportunity. If there's anything that you didn't get to say or you'd like to tell us or catch us up to speed on or that you wanted to make sure we, we knew or understood about your book, this is your chance. But I really want to thank you for letting us inside of your ideas and, and kind of giving us the view of a small farm future, your book and, and uh, er, pretty much everything we've talked about, we'll put in the show notes or description, but I really thank you for your time and, and your insights and wisdoms. Thank you. Well, that's no, been a real pleasure talking to you. I mean, obviously these, these discussions can go on forever. I mean, there's any number of things we can talk about, but there's nothing particularly I have to add I think we've had a pretty wide-ranging discussion and picked up on a lot of different aspects of the book so um, yeah I hope your listeners will have found it of interest and um, maybe we'll pick up the book and um, and perhaps um, you know come to my blog and um, continue the discussion there. I'm sure they will and we'll put all your links and descriptions and push them there and I, I really thank you and wish you a wonderful day. Thank you thank you very much. Thank you.